Thank you, Craig. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Henry Thrun. I'm one of the commentators here, and I oversee a, a Torah class that meets at 3 every Shabbat, if you're interested. And uh, this uh, study I, I put together a few years ago. The reason I did was I, when I first started coming to Corner Fringe, I first like started looking at the Torah, I got online, checked Facebook groups, and I heard about, um, I got into like uh, sacred name theology. And I don't know if it's still as prevalent now. It seemed to be all over the place back then. But um, I think this is a good, good timing for this one because in the Torah class, we, uh, last week we started going through the Ten Commandments. So I had to go back to kind of fundamentals. And we covered the first two commandments last week. And uh, we're, I was going to do pretty much this presentation on the third commandment today. So. Now we'll do it uh, for the sermon. And now I don't have anything for a Torah class, but uh, yeah. now you can come and uh, if you have any questions or anything, we can talk about there. Okay, now da uh, Daniel, he did a sacred name message a long time ago, uh, uh, back before we had all the video equipment. It's it's on our YouTube channel, and it's under the one, t one part teaching playlist, and that's more so focuses on Yeshua versus Jesus. Um, uh, whereas this one, will, I'm looking at, uh, like, names commonly attributed to the Father. Um, now, there are some different extreme ideas, and uh, from what, they seem to be based on the Third Commandment. You have, uh, like, Orthodox Jews who they won't use a tetragrammaton or write out the complete words Lord or God out of fear of misusing his name. Then on the other hand, you have uh, sacred name believers who, um, who won't use the words Lord or God at all because they believe they're pagan and they will only use the tetragrammaton. And some have told me to, it's to show respect. Others have told me it's a salvational issue. And so first I'll start out by looking at what the tetragrammaton is. This is from Wikipedia. The tetragrammaton uh, meaning four letters, is the Hebrew theonym uh, yod heh vav -He, commonly transliterated into Latin letters as Y-H-W-H. -H. It is one of the names of the God of Israel used in the Hebrew Bible. The name may be derived from a verb that means to be or to exist. Okay, so um, when it says uh, transliterated, like transliteration is a type of translation in which the individual letters of a word in one language are replaced by the letters of another language that make the same or similar sound. Uh, the old makes a Y sound, the hey makes an H sound, etc. Here's a note about the vowels associated with the tetragrammaton. The very oldest manuscripts of the Hebrew Old Testament do not show vowels at all. In these manuscripts, Jehovah is simply written Y-H-W-H. -H. These four letters are called the tetragrammaton. The oldest complete Hebrew manuscripts of the Old Testament were those copied by important scholars and rabbis called the Masoretes. The Masoretes added vowel notations to the Hebrew Old Testament to preserve its structure and sound. Although the vast majority of the consonants agree perfectly, and although a tremendous amount of the added vowel points completely agree, some of the best manuscripts, the Aleppo and Leningrad Codices, have as many as seven different vowel combinations associated with the name Jehovah. So the article goes on to look at the vowel pointers used with uh, other Hebrew words in the Tanakh that had the same letters as the tetragrammaton to try and determine its pronunciation. However, the article also mentioned the yod, which is commonly given the Y sound, has now been replaced by the hard J sound in the English language. In the same way, the vav used to, used to sound like a W, while now it's commonly pronounced as a V. And even when listening to different uh, people speaking Hebrew, just like with English speakers, one can often detect differences in dialect and how they, make, how they pronounce their vowels. It's, uh, it's made our Hebrew class interesting sometimes. Um, and here's another take on the vowel markers. As religiously observant Jews are forbidden to say the tetragrammaton in full, when reading the Torah, they use the word Adonai. And although most Christians have no prohibition on pronouncing the Tetragrammaton, in most Christian translations of the Bible, 
Lord, capital L-O-R-D, is used in place of the Tetragrammaton after the Hebrew Adonai and is often written with small capitals or in all caps to distinguish it from other words translated as Lord. So we have Adonai, which is translated as Lord, case Lord, and then the yod heh vav is translated as capital Lord. So why do they use two different forms of Lord? By about 700 AD, Jewish masters of, masters of tradition, or Masoretes, were adding a system of vowel points to indicate the accepted pronunciation. When handling the Tetragrammaton, vowel points for Adonai, Lord, and Elohim, God, were deliberately inserted. This reminded the leader that Lord, or God, should be substituted in public reading. It had long been Jewish practice not to pronounce the sacred name. When translations were made into Greek and later Latin, it became accepted practice to substitute words such as Lord in the translation. The first English versions from the Latin simply passed on this earlier decision. So since the vowel pointers were added later and were actually taken from different words, this would indicate we have no way of knowing exactly how it was originally pronounced. Now, I've heard there's debate on this point, which makes sense since there's such controversy over this topic. Uh, I once saw a video as blasting the King James translators for hiding God's name when they translated the Bible to English. But in reality, it was the early Jews who first translated the Tetragrammaton to Greek as if it were Adonai. I've read that there were some uh, Greek Septuagint manuscripts that did have a Tetragrammaton made up of Greek letters. And I've heard that there were Hebrew manuscripts with Adonai in place of Yahweh so there may have been a transitional period. Um, the Greek word commonly translated from Adonai is kurios. Kurios, like Adonai, is often translated to Lord in English. So we had uh, Adonai in Hebrew, and then in translate to Greek is kurios, and then translate English is Lord. Uh, for the sake of full disclosure, I am far from an expert in any of the languages we'll be looking at. Now, I've I'm still learning Hebrew, and I know even less of Greek. But actually, even yesterday, when I was going through this again, I made some changes uh, based on my current understanding of Hebrew they didn't have at the time. So, and now some will ask why I would do a study on this since I'm not an expert. The thing is, the majority of us aren't all that good at English even. <laughs> and much less other languages. But we still need to make decisions about how we practice the faith. That's why I put some of the studies together that I've done, because I've heard different viewpoints and needed to study them out. And, um, I was warned one time uh, in a previous sermon that teachers will face a stricter judgment. And so that's why I mentioned this, to encourage you to research and study this out on your own as well. Uh, don't just take my word for it or any single person's word, no matter how cool their YouTube video looks. Now, I'd like to take a look at Kurios in the Greek Septuagint. Now the Septuagint, and I'm sorry, I'm throwing out a lot of terms, so I'm trying to uh, uh, give definitions as I go here. I'm sorry, I think it went long. Okay, the Septuagint from the Latin uh, Septuaginta, or 70, is a translation of the Hebrew Bible and some related texts into Koine Greek. Now, Koine, from my understanding, meant the common Greek at the time. As the primary Greek translation of the Old Testament is also called the Greek Old Testament. This translation is quoted a number of times in the New Testament, it's all, um, particularly in Pauline epistles, and also by the Apostolic Fathers and later Greek Church Fathers. The title, um, let's see, the translation of the 70 and its Roman numeral acronym LXX refer to the legendary 70 Jewish scholars who solely translated the five books of Moses as early as the 3rd century BCE. So we see the Septuagint was translated by Jewish scholars and was translated before Yeshua was on earth. And it was quoted by the authors of the New Testament. Now here's an example from the Greek Septuagint. The Greek translation of the Tanakh where Yahweh and Adonai are both translated to Kurios. I think my clicker's not working. 
There it goes. Okay, so the New Testament Greek only uses the word kurios. Let's see if I can point out here. So here's here's like the uh, I got this offline a, a Greek Septuagint uh, and English uh, comparison. So here we have a kurios and another form of kurios. Uh, and um, this is the original, this is a Psalm 1101. So this is uh, from Bible Hub. This would be the original Hebrew. In the original Hebrew, we have the, we have the Tetragrammaton, the Yod Hey Vav Hey, uh, translated as capital Lord, like we talked about. And then here it's La Adonai. And now the, the La is added. This is um, extra Hebrew, but it's uh, an inseparable preposition, it's called. Like instead of having a word for as or like, they'll just add a letter to the front. So this is actually um, Adonai, and then in the English they translate it lowercase Lord. And so here, here it shows in the Greek Septuagint, which came from the Hebrew by the Jewish scholars. Before we translate to English, uh, they have like kurios and kurios. It's a little bit different form that happens in Hebrew too. So then in English we have, uh, they just use Lord in both cases. Okay, so... Um, so the, uh, the new, and now again, the New Testament was written by followers of Yeshua, including close apostles like John and Peter, and they had no issue with using kurios instead of the tetragrammaton, the yod heh vav -Hey. So I don't have an issue with using, using English words either. If it was such a big deal, I would imagine it would have been mentioned somewhere in the New Testament. Now, going back to the King James I actually give them credit for using all caps for Lord when they translated Yahweh in the Bible. They used the Greek Septuagint to help them, and seeing the difference uh, with the Hebrew, they made a distinction when writing the English. Now, I've heard some sacred namers cite the Peshitta, an Aramaic New Testament translation. The Peshitta is the standard version of the Bible for churches in the Syriac tradition. The general but not universal consensus among Bible scholars is that the Old Testament of the Peshitta was translated into Syriac from the Hebrew, probably in the 2nd century AD, and that the New Testament of the Peshitta was translated from the Greek. Syriac is a dialect or group of dialects of Eastern Aramaic originating in the northern Mesopotamia and around Edessa. So most scholars believe the New Testament was first written in Greek and later translated to Aramaic. I have talked to sacred namers, and when I say sacred namers, I hope that's not an offensive term. I don't think it is. But, um, and then they say uh, that the opposite is true, that the Peshitta was written first because that's the language the first century Jews spoke. And now, since I don't know Aramaic and am unable to read the Peshitta, I did some more looking around on this topic, and I found this article, an article that says... There, no. Katie, are you back there too yet? Or Okay, there it goes. Okay, it said, however, unlike the Koine Greek of the New Testament, the Aramaic of the Peshitta does not reflect language of the first century, but of the fourth and fifth centuries. So this article states that the Peshitta was probably written in the fourth or fifth centuries, while the Greek was written during the first century, the time of the apostles. Also, the majority of the New Testament texts we have now are in Greek. Okay, and then the article also states, Maria is also the Aramaic word used as a substitute for Jehovah, or the Tetragrammaton, in the Peshitta. Again, this is very similar to the words used in the Greek New Testament. The Greek New Testament also uses the Lord to represent the Tetragrammaton and to name Christ Jesus, who is the Lord. So according to this article, the Peshitta uses the word Maria, pretty much the same way the Greek New Testament and the Septuagint, Septuagint use the word kurios. So even if uh, one believes that the Aramaic and not the Greek was the original New Testament, there still isn't evidence that the Tetragrammaton was later maliciously hidden by those who translated it to Greek. Now I put up uh, Matthew 22:44 as an example. This is a, a verse where Yeshua was um, quoting the verse from Psalms uh, 110 we looked at earlier. So now on the top, 
is the New King James where it uses all capital Lord, where the Hebrew had Yahweh, and the Septuagint had uh, Kyrios. And so we see the Greek New Testament has the same Greek words that the Septuagint had. The last letters are different, but that, again, is just because of different forms in the Greek language. And again, I know even less of Greek than Hebrew, but I did read a short article about the concept. Uh, and you can see the same Strong's number is used for each, if you can see it from there. It's a pretty big TV, so you might be able to. Um, Okay, so this is an example of the New King James translators referencing the Hebrew, though the Greek did not. Because since uh, the Greek just had the Kyrios, they didn't capitalize it. When, the New, King, when the, the, the New King James and King James translators did, they still capitalized the English Lord because they knew it was from, is quoted from the Hebrew and the Tetragrammaton. Okay, and then I also have this verse uh, in the Peshetta that I found online. Now, again, I don't know any Aramaic, but you can see the same interior letters used in To My Lord. Let's see if uh, I passed it. Can you bring that one back up again? It's the one with all the red. I don't know why it's... Is it freezing up? Oh, there you go. Nope, that's not it. The next one, please. Okay, let's see. I'm sorry, I was producing it today too, so bear with me. Um, okay, so there, we have the same interior letters used in To My Lord. It's right here, it's got kind of like a square and then this little angle with a dot over it. See, that one's used in um, these other, in, these other uh, in this capital Lord, capital Lord, and capital Lord. And now, uh, Okay, so and so even though they're all caps for these other three lords, they're not all tetragrammatons if you look at the context. Can you go to the Matthew twenty-two forty-three slide, please? If someone's able to back there, please keep try bring me some new batteries. This uses uh, two triple A's. Maybe that's a problem. Thanks. Okay, so Matthew twenty-two forty-three. Jesus said to them, How then does David in the Spirit call his son the Christ Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls his son the Christ Lord, how is he his son? So in this context, I believe that Yeshua would be using Adonai in verse 43 and 45 which were the same word used for the Tetragrammaton in verse 44. And again, I haven't read the Peshitta, so I can't say for certain that the Tetragrammaton isn't in there anywhere. But I haven't found anyone pointing out that it is in there uh, anywhere, somewhere, but I may just not have found it. And uh, again, I apologize if this, if this is confusing. It's trying to discuss how different words got translated to the same word while discussing it in four different languages. But... <laughs> but it demonstrates how important it is to understand a language before we can make statements about how it's translated. Unfortunately, I've come across sacred namers who don't seem to know these languages that well. They base this theology on dreams as opposed to the totality of scripture. And others, they would just keep calling everything else pagan. I remember I was talking to one person online about it, and, she, uh, and then at one point I asked her, I like sent her a picture of the Hebrew primer we're using for class, and I was like, oh, we're on this chapter of the Hebrew primer. How much Hebrew do you know? And she's like, oh, I've just been studying the pagan names for seven years. So, um, But now I'd like to take a look at the etymology of the Tetragrammaton. Go to next slide. Thank you. So I think a lot of discrepancy in the pronunciation of uh, the old hey vav hey comes from the vav or wa. I've learned that the Vav can have different pronunciation based on whether or not there's a Degesh present and what its location is. The Degesh is a small dot and can make a Vav sound like a long O or like a double O, like an O. Also, I've read that while the Vav is pronounced like a V now, it used to be pronounced like a W. I think I mentioned that earlier. That's one of the challenges of going from commentaries to sermons is I end up repeating myself. Um, vowel pointers 
um, and the Geshes were not present in the original Hebrew manuscripts, as I recall. So again, that would indicate there's no real way to exactly know whether it was pronounced Yehovah, Yahuwah, or Yahweh. Also, even at the time, their pronunciations may have differed from group to group because of accents, just like among Americans and others today. Um, I've heard uh, the term, like, uh, I've heard this argument, the word Yehuda. I don't know if you can see it back here, but like uh, for, for the tribe of Judah, in the Hebrew, it's Yehuda. It's a yod hey, um, vav dalad hey. And I've heard the argument that if you take out the dalad, you have the yod hey, vav hey. And since it's commonly accepted that we pronounce it Yahuda, you take out the dalad, it would be Yahua. Except there's no, if you have different vowel pointers, that can change everything. Like a hey won't always sound like a ha. You know, sometimes it could sound like a he, etc. Like an example in English would be the word robot. If you take out the B, it's not robot, it's uh, then it's root. Um, now there's an example of pronunciation discussed in scripture. Let's see if it works. Oops. Judges 12.5. The, the Gileadites seized the fords of the Jordan before the Ephraimites arrived. And when any Ephraimite who escaped said, let me cross over, the men of Gilead would say to him, are you an Ephraimite? If he said no, then they would say to him, then say Shibboleth. And he would say Sibboleth, for he could not pronounce it right. Then they would take him and kill him at the forts of the Jordan. There fell at that time 42,000 Ephraimites. So there's like 42,000 people that they did this test with and that failed. So in the Hebrew, Shibboleth and Sibboleth start with different letters. The sheen makes the sh sound. And the samic makes this sound. And now, on a side note, the sheen can also make this sound, the S sound, depending on where the, there's a degesh with it, on which side it is. But, um, uh, like, for, th for this passage, it actually used the samic for sibboleth, with, which, as far as I know, can only be the S sound. And now, um, as Daniel addressed in his teaching, um, uh, in the his history of his name on the sacred name uh, teaching I mentioned earlier, there are people who also say you can only be saved by calling God's son Yeshua, Yehoshua, or Yahshua. Now, if this were the case, people like these Ephraimites would be doomed. If the Tetragrammaton had a chet, which makes a chet sound, I'd be in trouble. I can't really, I'm not doing it right. But the point of bringing this up is to show that even back then, among the same language, there were different accents, like today. And also, this demonstrates the authors of the Bible had the concept of distinguishing different sounds. If the correct pronunciation of the Tetragrammaton was required for salvation, I believe it would have been meticulously laid out somehow in the Bible. Deuteronomy 13.11, For this commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us, that we may hear and do it? But the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may do it. We don't have to go to extreme measures to discover what God is commanding us to do. All we have to do is read his word. God wants people to know and obey his law. If seeing the exact word for his name uh, was his desire, he would have told us plainly in his word, the way he plainly tells us to love others, to be honest and pure, to keep the seventh day Sabbath, to eat clean, and to observe his appointed days. The major problems with sin in the world today are that either people don't know their Bibles, they don't care to learn it, or they know it and have been deceived, or they just simply reject it. Here in the U.S., we have completely free access to the Bible. It's in many stores and even available online. Yet we are drowning in sin, even in the church. The problem isn't the word being hidden from us. It's the sinful hearts of the people who are rejecting it. Okay, now I want to go back to the Tetragrammaton. Can you hit for me, please? Uh, to the 3068 at the top. Thank you. 
According to Bible Hub, the Tetragrammaton appears over 6,000 times in the Tanakh. Given that it was written so often by the authors of the Bible themselves, I have a hard time coming to the conclusion that we are not supposed to be saying it like uh, some on the other end of the theological spectrum have concluded. Now again, I think if that were the case, the Bible's authors would have specifically mentioned that as well. And now, just to be clear, I have no problem with people using Hebrew words for God. If you've heard my commentaries, you may have noticed I frequently say Yahweh when all caps Lord is used. And this is why I like to say it. On the next slide, please. Okay, this is something I learned in one of the first Shabbat school lessons I taught here with the 8 to 12-year-olds. Here are the meaning, meanings of each of the letters of the Tetragrammaton. We've got the Yod, which can mean uh, an arm or closed hand, or also work through our worship. A Hey uh, is like a man with arms raised, uh, look, reveal, or breathe. And the vav is a, like a tent peg. It can be add, secure, or hook. And together, it makes out something like hand, behold, nail, behold. The sacred name of God itself prophetically contains the very way he was going to die for our sins. That's, when I, that's why when I see the capital Lord in the King James or New King James, I like to say Yahweh because of its prophetic meaning of Yeshua. Uh, this reminded me of the following passage from Luke when Yeshua appeared to his disciples after his resurrection. Luke 24, 36. Now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see, I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And we have the following account of Thomas in the Gospel of John. Next slide, please. Thank you. 20, 24. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here, and look at my hands, and reach your hand here, and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. And now, uh, after laying down uh, all that about the Tetragrammaton, I, now I'd like to look at the third commandment. Um, so getting into what we were uh, talking about with our new tour class. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, it's in um, Exodus 20, verse 7, and Deuteronomy 5, 11. You shall not take the name of the Lord or Yahweh your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Okay, so what does it mean do not take the name in vain. That's uh, kind of a question we ended our class with last week. Okay, so let's look at the Hebrew. Just like here in the New King James English, the Hebrew is letter for letter the same. Uh, Tissa is translated take here. Uh, and it's kind of hard to see, but I'll be going over the uh, important, uh, the main words here. So for, uh, for take, it's Tissa. And uh, the Strong's number is 5375, and it has a definition of lift, or carry, or take. It appears over 600 times in the Tanakh. I've got um, several samples uh, listed here. It can uh, be translated as bear. It's like, uh, for example, greater than I can bear. Uh, it's used a lot for lift up with uh, eyes, like uh, he lifted his eyes, his eyes up. Uh, and again, for lift up, like lifting up a lad or lifting up a person. Um, and these are just a few examples. But we see it appears to indicate something on a grander scale than a simple manner of speech. And uh, see, okay, in vain is lashav. The, the in is a la, a la, lamed. So uh, according to Strong's, it means emptiness or vanity. It's only used about 50 times in the Tanakh, the first time in the commandment in Exodus we're looking at now. Some other King James and New King James examples would include uh, false, as in a false report or false witness. 
uh, or futility is another way, uh, deceitful in describing men. Okay, I think these translations on this following slide better convey the meaning of this commandment. Okay, Young's literal translation, Thou dost not take up the name of Jehovah thy God for a vain thing. For Jehovah doth not acquit him who taketh up his name for a vain thing. Or the Amplified Bible, you shall not take the name of Yahweh your God in vain, that is, irreverently, in false affirmations, or in ways that impugn the character of God. For Yahweh will not hold guiltless nor leave unpunished the one who takes his name in vain, disregarding its reverence and its power. Okay, and here's a passage that seems to me to demonstrate what the third commandment is really about. Ezekiel 13.3. Thus says uh, the Lord Yahweh, Woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. O oh, Israel, your prophets are like foxes in the deserts. You have not gone up into the gaps to build a wall for the house of Israel to stand in battle on the day of Yahweh. They have envisioned futility and false divination, saying, Thus says the Yahweh, but Yahweh has not sent them. Yet they hope that the word may be confirmed. So futility here is shav. We see God rebuking them for saying that he spoke through them when in reality he didn't. Next slide, please. Uh, have you not seen a futile vision, shav? And have you not spoken false divination? You say, Yahweh says, but I have not spoken. Therefore, thus says the Lord Yahweh, because you have spoken nonsense and envisioned lies, Therefore, I am indeed against you, says the Lord Yahweh. Okay, God further, and now I think I touched on this later, but uh, something else they do in the English, like if it's Adonai Yahweh, uh, they'll translate the Adonai as Lord, but instead of doing Lord, Lord, they'll do God in all capital letters. Okay, so God further states that they were using his name to spread deceitfulness. In verse 9, my hand will be against the prophets who envision futility and who divine lies. They shall not be in the assembly of my people, nor be written in the record of the house of Israel, nor shall they enter into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord Yahweh. In this passage, the word shav came up four times, and it's all about prophets deceitfully claiming God was speaking through them. I'll get concerned when I hear people say stuff like, uh, God told me this, or the Holy Spirit told me that. It was a rather common occurrence at a church I used to go to, pretty much to the point where personal divine revelation was sought more than scripture. I've sometimes heard uh, sacred namers and Hebrew roots people put down other Christians for this type of thing, but then some of them will do the same thing, but instead say ruach, the uh, Hebrew word for spirit, instead. Like it's actually the Holy Spirit because they say it in Hebrew instead of English. So, personally, if I believe God is telling me something, I try to give a lot of disclaimers. I do not want to take his name in vain. Now, here are biblical examples of how God's name is profane, and it's not by using a different word for it. Leviticus 18.21, And you shall not let any of your descendants pass through the fire to Molech, nor shall you profane the name of your God, I am Yahweh. Leviticus 20, verse 3, I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from his people because he has given some of his descendants to Molech to defile my sanctuary and profane my holy name. Here we see that offering children as sacrifices to Molech well, profanes God's name. Leviticus 19, 11, You shall not steal, nor deal falsely, nor lie to one another, and you shall not swear by my name falsely, nor shall you profane the name of your God, I am Yahweh. You shall not cheat your neighbor, nor rob him. The wages of him who is hired shall not remain with you all night until morning. You shall not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but shall fear your God. I am Yahweh. Another example of using God's name deceitfully is here. Now, I can't think of any time in Scripture where God was rebuking people for using other words to identify him. It's my impression that people are using meanings for words in this commandment that aren't intended by the authors of the Bible. I read a sacred name believers post one time dismissing the idea that when the commandment says name, it means fame. He gave no explanation for dismissing the idea, and I believe it has a quite a bit of merit. For example, when people say they do something in the name of the law or the name of the king, 
when we see the word name used in Scripture to indicate something other than just the literal word used for a name. Next slide, please. The Hebrew word for name in the third commandment is Shem. Often you may hear Orthodox, Orthodox Jews refer to God as Hashem, meaning the name. The Ha means the. And this is because, like with not fully writing out Lord or God, they don't want to accidentally misuse his actual name. Shem is used over 800 times in the Tanakh, and most often means simply name, as in the label someone or something has, like Henry. Here's one example. Exodus 3.13. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, Yahweh, God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. Here Moses specifically asks what name he should use for God. And God didn't start out with the Tetragrammaton. He said, I am, or a yeh in the Hebrew. God did say Yahweh here along with Elohim. Now, I've read this, this is where the idea is derived that the Tetragrammaton may mean to be or to exist. Because God follows up, I am who I am, ayah asher ayah, reiterating simply that he exists with the Tetragrammaton. And we see in the last line, he says, this is my name forever and this is my memorial to all generations, making that connection between name and memorial or name and fame. Let's look at some of the other uses of the word Shem. Genesis 6, 4. This is like uh, what Daniel was talking about last week. There were giants on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Renown is Hashem. Uh, 11, 4. And they came, or and they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Genesis 10.32 indicates that they, here in Genesis 11.4, were the sons of Noah. So they already had a literal name and individual names. By creating uh, this outlandish tower, they were trying to build up fame or renown for themselves. Let's go to Exodus 34.5. Now Yahweh descended in the cloud and stood with them there and proclaimed the name of Yahweh. And Yahweh passed before him and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. So verse 5 says Yahweh proclaimed his name, and verse 6 explains he proclaimed several of his attributes. So again, this would appear to indicate, at least in this instance, that name is more than just a label. It actually appears to be his fame, like the other person I mentioned dismissed before. And this shows part of taking God's name in vain would be denying these attributes of him. If we, if we denied he's merciful, gracious, long-suffering, forgiving, yet just, we are taking his name in vain. Exodus 34:14. For you shall worship no other God, for Yahweh, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. So jealous isn't the word we use when we call on God. It's not the label that identifies him. In this case, again, it's an attribute. Deuteronomy 12, 11. Then there will be the place where Yahweh your God chooses to make his name abide. There you shall bring all that I command you. So when God's name abides there, it doesn't mean that like the letters that make up his name abide there. That It, it means... Uh, it's like his authority abides there. Again, Deuteronomy 14.23, And you shall eat before Yahweh your God in the place where he chooses to make his name abide, the tithe of your grain and your new wine and your oil, of the firstborn of your herds and your flocks, that you may learn to fear Yahweh your God. But if the journey is too long for you, so that you are not able to carry the tithe, or if the place where Yahweh your God chooses to put his name is too far from you, when Yahweh your God has blessed you, Okay, so if God put his name in a place, it doesn't mean it's nowhere else, and that's the only place it can be written or spoken. So I'm sorry if that, 
I don't want to come across like snark or anything. I'm just trying to demonstrate, make a point about uh, what the meaning of name is. Uh, Deuteronomy 18.5, For Yahweh your God has chosen him out of all your tribes to stand to minister in the name of Yahweh, him and his sons forever. Then he may serve in the name of Yahweh his God, as all his brethren the Levites do, who stand there before Yahweh. So here it's talking about how the Levites were serving under the authority of God. They weren't actually inside a name or in a place that was designated uh, with his name. So part of taking God's name in vain would be abusing the authority that he grants. You got Micah 4, 5. For all people walk each in the name of his God, but we will walk in the name of Yahweh, our God, forever and ever. So what does it mean to walk in the name of a God? We see examples throughout Scripture of people serving their gods through false sacrifices and evil rituals. And we see examples of the Israelites getting rebuked when they fell into those practices. So now, I once pointed out to a sacred namer online that the Bible gives no restriction about using a translation of God's name. To which he replied, that's because it's impossible to translate a name. Now, here are just two of the examples in Scripture that would indicate otherwise. Acts 9.36. At Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. And then Acts 13.6. Now, when they had gone through the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus. Verse 8. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. So now, according to Bible Hub, Tabitha is a Chaldean word, and Dorcas is a Greek word. Bar Jesus is English for the Greek word Bar Jesus, which is the transliteration of the name of Aramaic origin Bar and Yahushua. And Elamus is derived from either Aramaic or Arabic origin. So, with all this uh, transliteration and translation going on, I would think that God would have given specific instructions if this were indeed a salvational issue. After all, the languages were confused back at the Tower of Babel in Genesis, well before the commandments were given at Mount Sinai. The issue of whether or not it's okay to say God's name in different languages would have come up back then. Now I'd like to take a look at some of the other words used for God. Some of these we've already mentioned. Like we have Elohim. Someone on Facebook mentioned to me that he was surprised when he learned that Elohim wasn't the name of God. So we see there is still some confusion out there. Uh, and now I'd like to show some examples of Elohim used in the Bible. I have uh, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now I've heard the argument that God isn't actually his name, so flippantly using the word God is not actually taking his name in vain. But we see here Elohim is the word used for when he is introduced in the very first verse of the Bible as the creator of everything. He is often referred to as Elohim, or in English, God. So if he is your God, and you're using the word God as a swear word, you're taking his name in vain. Remember, we just looked at how a name isn't just a specific single word that's used as an identifying label. Uh, Genesis 2.4, this is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that Yahweh God made the earth and the heavens. Here we see Elohim and Yahweh used together, another thing that's common in the Bible. Then Exodus 20 verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. This is an example of the word Elohim used for false gods. I read a blog once where uh, someone noted how a certain Bible translation would transliterate the word Elohim when it was referring to Yahweh. So they would put like the E-L-O-H-I-M. But, if, uh, Elo but it would translate it to the English word God if it was referring to other gods. So like in Exodus 23, they would translate it like that versus Genesis 1.1. They would say in the beginning Elohim. The author of the blog found this practice to be disingenuous, and I have to agree. Who are we to create a restriction that the Bible's original authors didn't practice? Now, another word that we discussed earlier is Adonai. Uh, this is often translated to, to Lord when referring to Yahweh, as we talked about earlier. Here's some examples of Adonai in the Bible. I have uh, Genesis 15.2, but Abram said... Um, Lord God, or um, Adonai Yahweh, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, 
and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. In Genesis 18, 27, then Abraham answered and said, Indeed now, I who am but dust and ashes have taken it upon myself to speak to the, to the Lord. Now, um, yeah, I think I already covered that. To go to the next one, Deuteronomy 10, 17. This is kind of, I uh, thought, a fun one. So we have, um, for, the, for the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. So we have, uh, this was the Hebrew. We have Lord from Yahweh, the capital. Elohim. Elohim. Now the, the, the ending, Chem, like we've learned recently in Hebrew, that means it's like yours. That's a, a possessive for a group of people. Then we got God of gods is Elohe, Ha Elohim. The Ha can also be used for of. And Lord of lords, Wa Adonai, Ha Adonim. Uh, and the Im is a pluralization in Hebrew. And then the last God, they just put Ha'el. So they actually like uh, shorten Elohim. There's also a shortened form of Yahweh. In uh, Isaiah 26, 4. You have trust in the Lord forever. For in Yah, the Lord is everlasting strength. So we've got Jehovah is a tetragrammaton. But then um, uh, here, uh, here they put in God, but the Yah is just... Uh, the old and the hay. So they all use shortened versions of the Tetragrammaton in uh, the Hebrew. Now let's look at one of the Greek words used for God, Theos. Uh, theos is a common Greek translation for the Hebrew word Elohim. So usually if it's Elohim in the Hebrew, when they translate to Greek, it'll be Theos. And then it's the commonly translated to God in English. And I've heard... Uh, Sacred namers trace the word God back to a pagan deity cited in Isaiah 65, verse 11. But you are those who forsake Yahweh, who forget my holy mountain, who prepare a table for Gad, and who furnish a drink offering from Mani. So the name Gad here is a transliteration of the Hebrew word which means troop or fortune, as shown in this footnote. This is further supported by Bible Hub. The next slide, okay, yep. So here we have uh, fortune, this is for fortune, Lagad. Now let's look at the Strong's definition. Uh, now the only other time mentioned by Bible Hub that this word appears in Scripture is Genesis 30, verse 11. Next slide, please. Then Leah said, a troop comes. So she called his name Gad. So Leah named her son Gad. Uh, or fortune. The name of Gad for the tribe appears over 70 times in Scripture. So the idea is that because there was a pagan deity that was named after a regular word, we can't use a similar sounding word in a different language to refer to our Lord, even though an entire lineage of God's chosen people were also named after it. It would be like saying we can't call God creator because other religions refer to their gods as creator. And I don't know of any sort of prohibition like that in the Bible. For another example, to show that we shouldn't base theologies on an English word being similar to a Hebrew word that means something bad, I'd like to take a look at the next verse, Isaiah 5, 7. For the vineyard of Yahweh of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. Now, you won't see the significance in the English, but if we look at the bolded words in the original Hebrew, see, oh, I accidentally created a new slide. We have justice is mishpat. Uh, oppression is mishpak. So there's only, the last letter is the only difference. This is just a, an added letter for um, but. And then righteousness is uh, la zedakah. And a cry is zedakah. Again, there's just one letter difference. Hebrew itself has similar words that mean opposite things. Now, there's a lot we can learn from the original language, but we can't come up with theologies that aren't supported elsewhere based on grammatic nuances. 
The Bible doesn't warn against using other languages' words for God. And the authors and earlier, early translators even use Greek words like kurios and theos. Now I'd like to look at some examples of theos. Let's see, John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, theos, and the Word was God. Acts 17.23. For as I, Paul, was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God, or theos. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. So in John 1.1, 1, 1, when he was referring to the creator of the universe, he used the word theos. And this account in Acts 17.23, Paul was talking to men in Athens who asked to hear his doctrine. Rather than instruct them that they were worshiping the wrong God because they were using the Greek word for him, he appealed to the fact that they did acknowledge a God. A sacred namer once told me the idea of a Pharisee like Paul writing scripture in Greek was laughable. But I wondered why that would be. The main language of the day was Greek, like English is now. The Tanakh was translated to Greek, like we looked at earlier. Like when my family visits Kenya, almost all the signs are in English, and most everyone knows English and uses it. But a lot of people also use Swahili regularly. I imagine the Jews during the time of Yeshua and his disciples lived in a very similar situation. Consider the following exchange in Acts 21, verse 37. Then, as Paul was about to be led into the barracks, he said to the commander, May I speak to you? He replied, Can you speak Greek? Are you not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a rebellion and led the 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness? So the Greek commander here was surprised when Paul spoke Greek to him because he mistook Paul for an Egyptian. We continue. Verse 39. But Paul said, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city. And I implore you, permit me to speak to the people. So when he had given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs and motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, saying, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. So now notice how the author specifically mentions that Paul spoke to them in Hebrew. Because if their previous verses are any indicator, normally they'd probably be speaking Greek. So even if the Peshetta was written before the Greek New Testament, all these languages were being spoken together at the same time. People would have known if there were issues with translations and would have put warnings in the text about what words we can and cannot use for God. I imagine a lot of the sacred name doctrine perhaps originated from people who live in areas where only one language is spoken. However, Throughout history and today, there have been many areas where multiple languages were spoken simultaneously. Now, I'd like to take a look at one more Hebrew word used for Yahweh, rarely in the Hebrew Tanakh. Baal. Bible Hub says Baal is a Phoenician deity, and the vast majority of the time in the Bible, it refers to pagan gods. But there are instances where it's used in reference to Yahweh in the Tanakh. Jeremiah 3.14, Return, O backsliding children, says Yahweh, for I am married to you. I will take you, one from a city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. Now, if we look at this on Bible Hub, in Hebrew, it says Baalti, which is a form of Baal, meaning for I am a master or a husband. Here are a couple other verses. I have 2 Samuel 5.20, So David went to Baal Perazim, and David defeated them there. And he said, Yahweh has broken through my enemies before me like a breakthrough of water. Therefore, he called the name of that place Baal Perazim, literally master of breakthroughs. And that account is also in uh, 1 Chronicles 14, 11. Now notice in, that in 2 Samuel, the tetragrammaton was used. Yet in 1 Chronicles, Elohim is used, where we have God right there. Whereas there we had Yahweh. And it's not that they stopped using the Tetragrammaton by uh, the time of the book of Chronicles because it appears elsewhere in the book, even in that chapter. It's just another indication the biblical authors themselves didn't hold to the idea it was vital to call God strictly Yahweh as a, as a sacred name theology will claim. So anyway, if Baal is a pagan deity, why did David name places using that term where God performed breakthroughs for him? We see the footnotes state that Baal means master. 
uh, see, next slide, please. Baal was a title and honorific meaning Lord in the Northwest Semitic languages spoken in the Levant uh, during antiquity. From its use among people, it came to be applied to gods. The Hebrew scriptures compiled and curated over a span of centuries include early use of the term in reference to their god, Yahweh, generic use in reference to various Levin, Levantine deities, and finally pointed application towards Hadad, who was decried as a false god. Next slide, please. It was the program of Jezebel in the 9th century BCE to introduce into Israel's capital city of Samaria her Phoenician worship of Baal as opposed to the worship of Yahweh that made the name anathema to the Israelites. At first, the name Baal was used by the Jews for their God without discrimination. But as the struggle between the two religions developed, the name Baal was given up by the Israelites as a thing of shame. And even names like Jerubal were changed to Jerubosheth, with Hebrew Bosheth means shame. Next slide, please. Eshbaal became Ishbosheth, and Merabal became Mephibosheth. But other possibilities also occurred. Beeliada is mentioned, renamed as Eliada, and Gideon's name Jerubal was mentioned intact but glossed as a mockery of the Canaanite god, implying that he strove in vain. So we don't have to be worried if a word was derived from another word or the way it was used changed. I don't see anywhere in scripture people being concerned about etymology, translations, or the slang at the time. We see the opposite in practice here, where the biblical authors themselves went along with how language is changed, even to the extent of changing someone's name due to how the current society was using a word. I looked up other instances of the word Baalti from Jeremiah 3.14 at Bible Hub. It is also used for husband and married in other circumstances in regards to humans. So the New King James of Jeremiah 3.14 appears to also be accurate. Um, I bring this up to demonstrate that words in Hebrew, just like in English, can have different meanings. We have people today who make huge deals over how others use certain words in English. But we see the authors of the Bible over all those years never had such qualms. I also brought up this example to show languages and nuances within them have been changing pretty much since the beginning of time. Here are a couple examples from scripture of customs changing. Ruth 4.7. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm anything, one man took off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was a confirmation in Israel. And 1 Samuel 9.9. 9. Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he spoke thus, Come, let us go to the seer. For he who is now called a prophet was formerly called a seer. A term that may have been okay in the past to use for God may not be okay now, and vice versa. For example, I've heard that the word Allah is just the Arabic for the word God. But I'm not going to call our God by that name because it is commonly regarded as the God of Islam who is definitely not the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the father of Yeshua. I also brought this up because of a verse a sacred namer once gave me when I asked for any biblical evidence for his theology. Went to Hosea 2.16. And it shall be in that day, says Yahweh, that you will call me my husband and no longer call me my master. For I will take from her mouth the names of the Baals, and they shall be remembered by their name no more. So the person uh, said that words like God and Lord were the names it's describing in verse 17. However, based on what we've been looking at already, and on the contrast made in verse 16, God is saying that instead of him just being our master, Baali, he's going to be much closer than that. We read John 15, 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I heard from my father I have made known to you. So I think this is a good verse to wrap up with. We show we love God, love Yeshua, by doing his commandments. It's not using his Hebrew name that determines we're following him. It's our actions. And that's why things like the seventh-day Sabbath, the appointed times, and eating clean are so important. 
God's unique commandments are what set him apart from other gods. And those are the things that Satan has attacked so viciously and effectively. Okay, so again, I just want to reiterate that I'm no language expert and I'm still learning. Um, please feel free to research this on your own. And again, we'll be having our Torah class at 3. Is if, if you have any questions or uh, would like to discuss it further, you could come meet with us uh, then. So thanks and Shabbat Shalom. Thank you.